Greetings, future engineers of the world. I created this video to serve as a brief overview and introduction to the major terms and, and concepts that you're going to be seeing in any upcoming um, either mechanical um, or other engineering classes that focus on thermodynamics. Um, and so the best way to start any overview video is to start with a term that you're going to talk about itself. And so let's break down thermodynamics into its two component words and what that actually means. And so we'll start with dynamics. As I'm sure you know, a dynamic speech is a very moving speech, a very powerful speech. Um, you could also say a dynasty is a powerful family or, or a hierarchy that rules for a given amount of time. Um, and so um, dynamic, of course, in this case means force or power or energy. And so let's be very specific, though, with what those words mean, because you're going to be using them in very different contexts in your upcoming classes. Um, and so we'll start with power, because we said a dynamic speech is a very powerful speech. Um, and so power is defined as your change in energy. Remember that delta, the triangle symbol, means change. Um, divided by the change in time. Um, and the thing is, you sometimes see this defined not as change in energy over change in time, but instead work over time. And work is actually the same thing because both work and energy and potential energy and kinetic energy, basically all forms of energy, have the same units of joules. And so it's just another side of energy or an application of energy. And the way that you usually see this defined in most physics classes is a force times the displacement, um, thus you could say work equals force times displacement, technically times the cosine of theta, but we'll, we'll skip the trig for today to keep focused on the fundamentals here. Um, of course, you would then divide that whole term by time if you want it to be power. All right, now I also want to mark above here a little symbol, and so you will sometimes see these little arrows over terms. Whenever you see it, it just means that that's a vector, and so that means it has both magnitude and direction with its quantity. And so notice that work here, work actually is a scalar, it doesn't have direction implied, whereas force and displacement are both vectors. Now, we're going to get into that a little bit later on, because it'll help kind of make sense of work and how it's doing things. Um, but in thermodynamics classes, most of the time that you talk about work, you know, either being done on a system or by a system, and we'll get into those terms in a little bit, um, it's more about compression and expansion, not really about moving something over a given distance. And so the formula for work in that context is pressure times the change in volume. Now I challenge you, those of you who are pretty good at your units, to justify using your units how pressure times change in volume is actually the same units as force times displacement. I won't go through it in this video here, um, but I promise you the units will work out exactly the same as it always does in any physics concept. Um, and so that is our uh, dynamics, right? So notice power, energy, work, force, we're using all of those terms there on the dynamic side of the page. But we haven't yet talked about thermo, and thermo is even easier for most of us because we've heard many word roots that use thermo. Um, a thermometer measures temperature, a therm is a unit of heat, um, but notice that thermometer measures temperature and a therm is a unit of heat, heat and temperature aren't actually the same thing. They are commonly um, confused to be the same thing, but they're quite different. Um, in fact, heat, which is often represented as a simple Q, and I'll start with that up there, um, that is equal to your heat. And so what heat really means is that it is energy moving into or out of systems. So either into or out of any given system. And we'll be specific with what we mean by systems and energy moving in a little bit further. But first we want to make sure that we're very comfortable with the term heat as well as the other one that we just defined, temperature. And so temperature and heat are very related, but they're not actually the exact same thing. So let's break down the difference. And in fact, there's a formula that specifically shows you the difference, and that's the internal energy, that's of any system, is equal to 3 halves nRT. Now, I don't really want to get into the full equation here. It's not important for this uh, this introductory session. Um, but what does really matter here is the idea that the internal energy, that U symbol there, is, as you can see, directly proportional to temperature. So internal energy is all of the movement, the vibration, the wobble um, that you have within your elements. And so the higher the temperature of that system is, the more those elements are going to be bouncing around and vibrating and moving all over the place. Um, and a nice way to think about this, um, to give it bearing, is to think of zero degrees Kelvin. And so that's defined as absolute zero. So zero Kelvin, um, that's negative 273 Celsius. And that's the temperature at which all random atomic motion stops. Atoms actually become perfectly still. And so at zero degrees Kelvin, as you can see, if the temperature is equal to zero, that means that the internal energy also would be equal to zero, and there would be absolutely no movement whatsoever. 
So as you start adding more heat to that system and raising its temperature, then they start moving, vibrating, bouncing around more, and eventually once you have a high enough temperature, things would actually be moving like we normally see atoms moving, which is all over the place. All right, so now that's heat and temperature, which is the thermo side. We have the dynamics, the power, the work, the energy. But the real bridge and what you'll be mostly focusing on in at least the beginning parts of your thermodynamics class is the relationship between those two. And so let's start by combining these two colors into our big relating equation, delta U, or the change, once again, internal energy, is equal to the heat that is either entering or leaving that system minus the work done by that system. All right, now this equation is very fundamental, but in order to use it, we have to be very comfortable with what all of these terms mean. And the newest term here that we haven't really got into is why it is work done by the system. And so let's get specific with on and by and how that would look differently. Um, and so I'll start off by drawing a little system down here. And so if this is your system, and the nice thing about um, systems is that you get to define your system as anything that you want it to be. Uh, it really doesn't matter. You can say that a water bottle is a system, a balloon is a system. You could even define the entire universe as your system if you want to do so. Um, it really doesn't make a difference. So make that a little bigger so we can see this a little clearer. So since this is a gaseous system, and we'll assume it's a gaseous system for the sake of this video, um, there's a lot of movement of those particles. Gases are the highest, well, not highest, but a very high energy form of matter. Um, and so they move around a lot, they bounce off things a lot, and in this case, it will be the same. All of those little gas particles are gonna be bouncing off the walls of the container. So they're slamming into it in all directions. I'll show it in all directions. If you want to, you can isolate this to a single dimension, but I'm almost kind of show it all for now. And then, Conversely, since we've got this system has gas particles bouncing off the inner walls, there's also air outside of your system. And those gas particles will be bouncing off the walls onto that system itself. And so once you actually visualize it by showing these different arrows, and notice these arrows have both direction and magnitude, which means they are vectors. These would actually be your little force vectors. You can see this is your little force. Um, and you can tell that this is the force being applied on the system. Because if you think of those particles that are pushing in the system, that of course is being on it, being applied to it. Um, and so when we talk about force on the system, you can really say that's going to relate to the work done on the system as well. But in order for it to be actually work done, we do need, need, know that we need to, of course, have it being multiplied by a displacement. So unless there's actual movement, unless this box actually does get squished inwards, or outwards for that matter, there's not going to be any net work that's done. All right, so we can do the same thing for the other direction. Notice the inner circles there, or the inner, excuse me, arrows there. Um, those are showing the little force vectors that are being applied by the system. And you can see that also relates, if there is actual movement, to the work done by that system. So let's actually talk about actual work and show how this would happen if there was movement. And let's say that this system, in fact, does get, oh, let's make it expand. So we'll erase these for now. And let's say that this whole system decides to expand outwards. These green arrows push back and make the whole thing grow. And we'll say the system grows to get larger. So there is an expansion process that occurs here. So all these vectors actually did win the battle in terms of by the system or on the system. And now it has grown quite a bit larger. Um, so we still have the system. Um, it, it's quite grown. So we could say that there has been a displacement that occurred. So notice that your displacement now has gone outwards. And you can do that same displacement vector in all directions. Notice that the system has expanded. All right, so let's go back to our work concept at the very top of the page. So we defined work as a component of two vectors being multiplied, the force times the displacement. Um, and so if you look at these two vectors now, notice that we have our green vectors were the ones that were pointing outwards. So your vector points in the outwards direction. Also, that displacement vector points in the outward direction. And if you ever have two vectors that point in the same direction and you multiply them, that means you get a positive term. So that means in this context, if you look at the work done by the system, as we showed before, that work by, of course, was the outward vector, um, it would be positive in expansion. And you could do the exact opposite as well. So notice if you look at the on vectors, and we still have a couple drawn there, but of course now the system is expanded, so your little on vectors are now 
pushing on the outside of the system. And of course, that happens in all directions as well. Um, but if you look at the direction of this, remember this is the force that's being done on the system, you can see that the vector of forces being applied on the system are opposite in direction to the actual displacement of that system. And if your vectors point in opposite directions, that means they have opposite signs. And if you ever multiply two things with opposite signs, you're always going to get a negative term. So notice the work done on the system in this context, since it's actually expanding and the force on the system is pushing downwards, you would have negative work on the system in this process of expansion. Now you could do the exact same thing, of course, if you wanted to go through a compression process, um, but instead of doing that, I want to show you that it's actually the same formula that we talked about previously when we talked about P delta V. And so notice if you talk about your change in volume, and so if your change in volume term here is expanding, because it's expansion, as we said before, notice you've got a positive term right there. And so notice if you have P delta V, and that's actually the other form for work by the system, so P times delta V, you'll notice that you actually do have a positive term. So positive work is done by the system during expansion, whether you want to think of it as your vector components being multiplied, or if you think of it as just pressure times your change in volume, um, work by the system is, in fact, positive when it's expanding and negative when it's being compressed. All right, so now that's just one part of it, though. There is another aspect that we have to discuss if we really want to tie all of these terms together and relate to the internal energy, as we said, is our fundamental equation right here. Um, and that is the heat term, the Q. Now, this one tends to be a bit more straightforward um, because we uh, have really nice straightforward word roots. Uh, so if you have heat moving into the system, so a positive value for Q, that means heat's going in too. And any time that heat enters a system or moves into it, that's known as an endothermic process. So endo means into. You could use word roots there. Um, and also your negative Q, that means things are going out of, leaving the system. And that would be exothermic. Once again, word roots like exit. Exo is the same. Or, or even exoskeleton is the outside protective covering for bugs. It's all the same word roots. That's the best. All right, so now notice that you can have multiple ways that you could change the internal energy of the system. As we said before, you could have work being done, and that could result in a change in the internal energy, or you could be adding heat to that system, which could also change the internal energy. But sometimes the internal energy doesn't actually change. In fact, you can apply heat to a system without the energy changing at all. And so let's break down two new terms. And these are the only two we'll focus on in terms of thermodynamic processes, but in fact, there's quite a few. And the first one is known as an isothermal system. So in an isothermal system, as the name suggests, iso meaning same, like isotonic is the same concentration across two membranes. Um, isothermal means there is no change in temperature. So remember, temperature and internal energy are synonymous. So no change in temperature means no change in internal energy which means you can then rearrange this equation since there's no change in internal energy. You can get rid of that delta U term and you could say that your Q is equal to your work done by that system. Now, notice what this actually means, and this is the part that tends to confuse some people, is that you can actually add heat to a system, right? An endothermic process where the Q goes upwards. You're adding heat to it. And since the temperature can't change, that means that you'll have positive work done by the system. And as we said before, positive work done by the system is expansion. So you could think of maybe a hot air balloon. You add heat to that system, which causes that system to expand. Um, and that would be um, an example of an isothermal process. Of course, a hot air balloon is not technically going to be truly isothermal, um, but the idea is the same. Adding heat to systems does result in a tendency for those systems to expand. And we could do one more example here, and we'll get rid of these plus symbols to make it a little bit cleaner looking. Um, and that is known as an adiabatic process. So adiabatic processes isolate a different term. Instead of saying that your internal energy does not change, it's not that your internal energy doesn't change, it's that your heat doesn't change. And so there is no heat entering or leaving that system which means you could then define an adiabatic process as Q being equal to zero. So no heat enters or leaves, which then gives you also just a little bit of algebra here will show us that the change in internal energy of that system is equal to the negative work done by that system using the same equation as before.
So then let's give an example here. And so um, before we talked about an expansion, and so in an expansion process, just as we saw before, the work done by the system was in fact positive, once again using the same example. And so if you have positive work being done by the system, notice you have a positive symbol here, which means it's being multiplied by the negative there, and if you ever multiply a positive and a negative together, you always get a negative term, thus net resulting in a negative change in internal energy. Um, and if you have a negative change in internal energy, that means that your temperature is going to drop. It will get cold. And a common real life example of this would be something like a can of compressed air that we use to clean out your keyboards when they get dirty. So if you ever have used one of those before, you've noticed that as you spray your keyboard, that canister gets very, very cold. I um, mean, that's because as that expands, and in fact, the key word here for adiabatic is any kind of fast or rapid expansion, and those compressed air canisters for release air very quickly, um, in a very fast expansion, it tends to be adiabatic because the system doesn't have time to equilibrate with its surroundings. So very fast expansion results in a drop in internal energy, thus a drop in temperature, which means you can feel that can get cold. And of course, you could say the opposite. In a very rapid or fast compression, you would have the internal energy go up, which results in a very, very hot system. All right, now this is just two of the terms that you will see in thermodynamics classes, but hopefully this has introduced the major concepts you'll be seeing and at least get you comfortable with the terms that are coming up in the very near future.